Mort? Who knows? Who knows? Who ever knows? Who ever knows? Hey, John. Mort, you got up. Go ahead, pal. Don't, don't, don't. Stay down there. <laughs> Hiya, buddy. So. Nice to see you. Everything all right? Found it all right? Yeah, yeah. Everything went very well. So it sounds like... That's uh, some town. Yeah. Toddling. The energy's there, you know. Yeah, yeah. And you know when you go into the mob steakhouses? Yeah. The money's going under the table, yeah. and the mayor's son is there, <laughs> and everybody's kind of with it. You know what I mean? Right, right. They're with the plan. Yeah. The Irish and the Italians. And yeah. They need to do just a quick little sound check with your Let's go. You met the Noel and Jimmy downstairs? Yeah. I've never been here before. No, we really oh, next to us. Be careful on this step. This one right here. You ever been in here, John? Nope. <laughs> uh, now, is that mic going to be that far away from you when it's on your sweater? This? About. Yeah. I think that mic would be a little higher. Right. Try Try that. Okay. Yeah, I think John is right. Uh, anyway, I am uh, really just thrilled to uh, to be presenting him to you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Morton Salt. kidding about the hungry eye, you know. That's all we had uh, was minstrels up there, you know. <laughs> and they all sang about uh, uh, songs that had no authors, you know, they were just organically developed by uh, black prisoners, all of them were framed, of course. <laughs> Edward Asner, please copy. Uh, <laughs> Governor Schwarzenegger. <laughs> If the Germans had won. <laughs> Today, California, tomorrow, the world. So uh, we're trying to get a balance on this, so don't mind us. We wanted the freedom of not being tied to a uh, stand-up mic. The, uh, uh, the, uh, and the other um, um, candidate who is in the neighborhood is Arianna Huffington, who uh, thinks the Attorney General is somebody who goes over prenuptial agreements. <laughs> that poor guy. But uh, he liberated her to take care of the rest of us. So uh, she was on last night. You know, she's getting undue coverage um, on a show called Real Time with Bill Maher. And Bill Maher kept saying to her, uh, my father was Irish, uh, but I'm half Jewish. So the question before the House is, when does the Jewish part come in? Uh, while you're thinking about that, uh, did you see the president at the White House? Well, uh, I know the president, and uh, that may shock you. Uh, but um, the, uh, I met the president when he was running his father's campaign for re-election at the White House. and. Uh, what did you think of Mort? Well, I thought he was a real ankle biter. <laughs> you know, and he, uh, so, <laughs> anyway, you may have noticed the New York Times today, which is our source material for the evening, uh, they had some kind of a, 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 a service at this naval air base in San Diego where he was out raising money, you know, President Reagan, 220 million, so he can run again. So uh, there was some kind of a service there, and a, a priest officiated, a Catholic priest. And Bush says in here, he's quoted as saying, he's not of my faith, but he touched me. <laughs> but not inappropriately. <laughs> and the president, as you know, is a, uh, a born-again Christian. <laughs> So why would you come back as George Bush? <laughs> so he, he said, when he first ran for office, he could have told you, I met him when the old man was around, George the First. 
And uh, as part of my work, you know, I get around and meet all these guys. And uh, uh, all right, so he, uh, uh, when he first announced, he was the governor of Texas. And he had burned 345 guys. You remember that? The Green Mile. And uh, so uh, he believes in capital punishment, you know. Which brings us to another subject, because when Pete Wilson was running for governor here, we had an illustrious, uh, you know, precedent for governor in California. Schwarzenegger, uh, you know, what would he do with the Palestinians? Give them gambling. It's like a drinking, but anyway. <laughs> Pete Wilson, who was now a greeter at the Mirage Hotel. <laughs> he, Pete Wilson was backed by Schwarzenegger, who's a Republican, of course. And uh, uh, Schwarzenegger uh, is talking to him, and he said, uh, we had enough of Jerry Brown, whom he referred to as Governor Moonbeam. It's Gray Davis is Governor Lowbeam. So, Gray Davis, the light that failed. Anyway, uh, you, you saw the blackout, speaking of lights failing. You saw the blackout that said CNN ran, uh, ran this, thing, uh, this uh, super imposition at the bottom of the screen saying that the hospitals have no power. And MSNBC ran a super imposition saying, on the other hand, uh, the banks have no power, <laughs> ATMs and everything. And uh, the hospitals, of course, uh, their power was restored by Mayor Bloomberg immediately, and they were up and billing in the morning. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, a wonderful group. So, uh, it almost sounds like Bob Hope. I, you know, I talked to Woody Allen yesterday, of all people, he said to me, I can't imagine a world without Bob Hope. That's just about right, you know. And uh, uh, at any rate, to return, not to digress, uh, <laughs> Schwarzenegger is talking to Pete Wilson. And he says to Wilson, we had enough of Jerry Brown, we had enough of Rose Byrd in the Supreme Court. Are you going to reinstitute capital punishment? So Wilson says, that's my first priority. <laughs> so that's too vague for Arnold Schwarzenegger. So he says, when can we look forward to some executions? <laughs> So, you know, take it from there. And, uh, so, uh, anyway, but I wouldn't ridicule Arnold Schwarzenegger tonight because he is a Kennedy. Let's try and remember that <laughs> to the polls. Uh, now, uh, the president. So when I met the president, he was the governor of Texas, executing all these people. And he decided that, that he was needed. You know, because extraordinary times demand an ordinary man. <laughs> So, so he decided to run, right? And uh, so he holds his press conference, and I go down there, and I'm standing like next to Michael Kensley, uh, who used to be uh, on Crossfire, you know, and then went to work putting out Slate for uh, Bill Gates, whose wife is in an institution in near Seattle after her breakdown trying to get through the prenuptial agreement. So, <laughs> And Warren Buffett, his best friend, is of course backing Schwarzenegger. Wants to triple the property tax. And uh, also George Schultz, who was, you know, sponsored Condoleezza Rice. I don't know if you know that. And uh, George Schultz had suggested to Bush last year, about this time, that Condoleezza Rice run for governor here. And they also wanted to knock off Barbara Boxer. And when Clinton, is this confusing you? <laughs> When Clinton was, uh, it confuses me, uh, uh, when Clinton was being impeached, do you remember when uh, Justice Rehnquist came out with that gown with the Nike stripes? <laughs> when the Senate was impeaching him, then uh, 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 um, he was defended uh, by this black lawyer from uh, the law firm. And uh, Barbara Boxer has a special thing about that. The same thing when they were going to confirm uh, uh, what was her name? Cheryl something. Anyway, uh, when, when uh, Condoleezza Rice was going to be uh, confirmed, she had to go up before uh, the, the uh, uh, Judiciary Committee, and Boxer is on that committee. So uh, Boxer passed out. They said, uh, you know, Dr. Rice, do you promise uh, you know, to leave Chevron for the rest of your middle age and all that? And uh, Barbara Boxer passed out, and the paramedics came into the Capitol. And when they revived her, Barbara Boxer said, I was overwhelmed emotionally 
by the idea of a black person being in the front of this committee. And uh, uh, Condoleezza Rice said, where? <laughs> This administration also has Colin Powell, who is the designated diplomat in his group, uh, in making uh, full-time war for full-time peace. Wonderful guys. Uh, Rumsfeld and, uh, and uh, Cheney being at the, the head of the line there. And uh, Cheney, if you don't remember him, because nobody's seen him. <laughs> you could, you could have taken a hike, but uh, nobody's seen him. And uh, Cheney's wife was on the Larry King Show Friday. And she talked about how they met at the University of Wyoming. And uh, uh, kind of a spirited school, you know. Uh, and uh, so she said, Cheney approached her timorously and said, you know, if you're free Friday night, I, I was hoping you could meet me in an undisclosed secure under <laughs> What a crap. Anyway, so. So. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm in Austin with Michael Kinsley and some other press people, and Bush comes out and he says, uh, you know how he leans on the lectern? First he walks like that. <laughs> and then he leans and he says, I've been persuaded by the people I trust most. That's Karl Rove. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and Karen Hughes, who's supposedly departed, to run for the presidency, let's say the country, from the Democrats. So he... Uh, he starts to talk, and uh, the press immediately attacked him. You know, isn't it true you used cocaine when you were at Yale, and you were a drunk, and you got busted in Denver and all this? So he said, no, I, uh, I was born again, and my mother brought Billy Graham to Kenny Bunport, and we prayed on the rug, and I realize now I can get in the kingdom of heaven because I've accepted Jesus Christ in my heart. This is a press conference. <laughs> you know, it's not as if it were a rally for Israel. So, <laughs> NPR, National Palestinian Radio. So, so we go, uh, we're standing there, and uh, Bush says, those who don't accept Jesus can't get into the kingdom of heaven. So Michael Kensley says, Governor, uh, wasn't Jesus Jewish? So Bush thinks about this. <laughs> and you know how Jesus cheek? And then, uh, you know, being a born-again Christian, he chews the other one. <laughs> and then he says, uh, well, he was. So Kinsley says, well, how do you reconcile that? If he was Jewish, and you, you're Jewish, you can't get into heaven. So he thought about it for a while, and he didn't say anything. So I said, what is he implying? And Kinsley said to me, that they're not making Jews the way they used to. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, that's the, uh, it's, a, it's a long way, you know, it has no sense of humor whatsoever, and uh, none of them have had, except uh, since Reagan, which is, you know, 20, 20 plus years, the old man didn't have any sense of humor either. Uh, there's no, uh, Kennedy had a sense of humor. Uh, you know, when, when Kennedy was elected, Wall Street was saying it was the end of the system. You know, they'd give everything away and build more veterans' hospitals. <laughs> give everything to the minorities and take away their, their incentive and everything. So, uh, <laughs> Kennedy called together the 100 biggest men on Wall Street, and he flew to New York to reassure them. And uh, they were sitting there, you know, very skeptical. He thought his father had invented them, you know. They're all like this. And he said, uh, uh, your fears, you know, I want to mitigate your fears. Uh, I believe in a system of capitalism. They were all, you know. <laughs> and he said, uh, in fact, I endorse it totally, and if I weren't president, I would buy stock. And these hundred guys stood up together and said in unison, if you weren't president, we'd buy stock. <laughs> That's a true story. And uh, everything I tell you tonight is uh, true, but uh, that was actual. So, <laughs> George Bush. So, uh, now let me give you the best part. So, you know, when I'm not doing this, when I'm not home in L.A., uh, I'm an L.A. kid, you know, people find hard to believe. Uh, people find a lot hard to believe about me. You know, I went to West Point, too. 
and uh, anything for a free education. <laughs> I had to get my father to stop yelling at me. So, I, uh, oh, one other thing. Today I was looking at C-SPAN, and Jerry Springer came up to announce he's not running for the Senate from Illinois. And he talked about America, and he said, uh, when he came here, he said, I am living proof that the American dream can come true. Isn't there some other way we can prove the dream? <laughs> <laughs> so, and, uh, you've seen that show, haven't you? He, there's usually a black guy on it with his new girlfriend and his wife comes out and they try to punch each other. You've seen that, haven't you? It's on all the channels all the time. And uh, uh, it would be different in a Jewish culture, you know? that this guy's run away with my wife and we've become good friends. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I've been, uh, I've been touring and I was in Chicago up to last night and uh, before that uh, we were in New York, which is in a perpetual state of war because of 9-11. First 9-11, then the first anniversary, now the second anniversary is coming. So it was a DEF CON orange alert even before the blackout. And I uh, took a ride to the harbor, I, and uh, there were all the signs up there from Ashcroft, you know, do you fit the profile <laughs> and everything. And uh, I thought I saw the Statue of Liberty crying, but I'm not sure. Uh, Lincoln uh, in the memorial is wearing a gas mask now, because <laughs> of the anthrax scare. So the people that search me at the airport fit the profile, if you want to get into that. <laughs> what else? My good friend Mark Russell said to me the other day on the telephone, he said, is there any way we can thaw Ted Williams and freeze George Bush? <laughs> well, he's great. Remember when, that, when the, the president's father got sick and threw up on the Japanese ambassador? Uh, Mark said to me, being a Yale man, the white wine came up with the fish. <laughs> So, uh, well, you've got to be a Californian to know about all that. You don't know. We invented Nouvelle Cuisine. You see it when you go to New York and Chicago. Everybody's got that vertical food, you know, <laughs> the pots, <laughs> minimal. And, uh, you know, at the height of the Depression, Roosevelt said, uh, one third of a nation uh, goes to bed hungry. And uh, they all had dinner in Beverly Hills earlier that night. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? And for all of that, the debate now has come down uh, to abortion. They never talk about it. They talk about abortion. The Democrats don't want anybody to be born. That's their position. <laughs> By imperative and contraception, and the woman owns her own body and all that. So if the Democrats win, no one will be born. <laughs> and uh, the Republicans don't mind how many people are born, as long as you agree not to live long enough to collect your social security. <laughs> Wonderful group of people. And, uh, Hillary Clinton is the, the white hope of this party uh, that was once run by uh, Adlai Stevenson and uh, Eugene McCarthy, who I talked to, by the way. This is a great life. You know, I get a lot of bonuses. I talked to McCarthy, who is uh, uh, really sharp. He's 87 now, you know, and he... Uh, when he ran for president the last time, you know, he ran against Clinton in the, in the New Hampshire primary just to force the debate about Hillary and her Rose law firm, remember all that. So anyway, he, uh, he remember that. There was a big scandal, and senators would investigate and say, what did the president know, and when did his wife tell him? <laughs> so uh, they're still married. God bless them. I didn't say happy, but I said that. That's the important part. Symbolism. So. Anyway, uh, and to, uh, uh, to return to this, uh, I was with McCarthy in the lobby of the Holiday Inn in Manchester, New Hampshire, and Diane Sawyer, you've seen her, right, on television, took the place of Barbara Walters, and then her place was taken by Connie Chung briefly, then she came back. Remember? So anyway, that's why we're all so well informed. <laughs> so Barbara Walters, I mean uh, Diane Sawyer, says to McCarthy, it's really pathetic to see you out here, you know, because it's not the 60s, and you don't, can you face the fact that you don't have that many followers? So McCarthy says, uh, you know, Jesus only had 12. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them turned out to be unreliable. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
<laughs> and it was later learned that he was the treasurer. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> that's what Bush said today. He was raising the money in San Diego for the re-election. He said, uh, they asked him who these people are. They're called the Republican Pioneers, this group. They give $150,000 minimum to him. And uh, he said, they're people who have put money on the table. Or under the table. So, <laughs> one of the big guys for him here has an office at um, the number one fundraiser here is an investment banker uh, named Brad Freeman at Santa, in the big tower at Santa Monica and uh, Sepulveda. And uh, I had occasion to meet Freeman at a party, and he said to me, uh, most of those liberal actors, you know, uh, why are they liberals? This country's been good to them. <laughs> so, uh, I said, well, guilt, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> Which, of course, he denied. And then he said to me, this is true, true story, he said to me, why are uh, more people Republicans? I said, well, they're poor. <laughs> and there are several other additional reasons. And the leader, the leader of the liberal community here uh, made up of Arianna Huffington and Warren Beatty and Susan Saron, but they, uh, is Norman Lear. And uh, I was talking to Norman Lear uh, recently because he, uh, he's sending a, a bus through the country to register black people to vote. You know, and uh, I said, well, the, uh, you mean for Sharpton? <laughs> he said, who? I said, Sharpton, a black guy. And uh, Norman said, I listen to his message, but to tell you the truth, I never noticed whether he's black or... <laughs> then the secretary tried to interrupt this, but he was so focused on what I was presenting, that he said, hold all my awards, I'm more. <laughs> so, you know, it's been rewarding, whatever his job is. Uh, now, well, let, let, us, uh, let us return here as we review uh, the events of the day. Mayor Bloomberg leadership out of the blackout. And we uh, and now we've got uh, 193 people running for uh, governor, is that right? And, uh, oh man, uh, and Jerry Brown is the mayor of Oakland. <laughs> He's the mayor of Los Angeles, you remember? <laughs> Where's he? Separated from his wife. Pressure that job. <laughs> Trying to subdivide the airport for condominiums. <laughs> so, Anyway, uh, more of this later. Let me return to that. I did go to West Point, and uh, my upperclassman at West Point was General Alexander Haig, formerly of the AOL board, and the Secretary of State to Ronald Reagan. And uh, Haig was a very tough upperclassman. He used to come through with a flashlight at night after bed check, you know, and give you demerits if you were. You could be asleep and in your bed, but if you had a smile on your face. <laughs> so, uh, you know, a lot of people have asked, uh, in a somewhat critical uh, demeanor, they've asked uh, why I don't do more racy material in keeping with the times. You know, because I don't know if you've been out to seeing comedians lately, but, you know, they, they curse a lot. I mean, they're very colorful in exponentially raising their passion declarations. <laughs> So I think it's gone too far. I've seen too many movies with people cursing and everything. So let me tell you how it's, it's uh, come down on the society. I went to dinner in uh, Beverly Hills. You know, standard place, you know. You know, La Cazoo, you know those places. <laughs> <laughs> and these people are going by and they're trying to get a bread basket. And like, waitress, waitress. Waitress, and finally, in desperation, say, actress, and they all <laughs> So, I'm in a restaurant, and uh, my lawyer is there, you know. He's an entertainment lawyer. So, uh, he said, uh, he introduced me to his new wife. And she's one of the new people, no matter how elegantly they're turned out. You know, with the searchlight on her hand. <laughs> She's cursing to underline everything. So she turns to me, and uh, she wants to illustrate to me that she's underwhelmed at meeting me. So uh, I probably offended her parents sometimes. <laughs> so I, she says to me, How many times have you been married? 
So I said, uh, as it happens, three. And she said, you're all alike. So, you know, I've been so lonely for so many years. When she said, you're all, I looked around, you know, see the others are. <laughs> and uh, I said, who? She said, men, you're all alike. And I said, it, how, specifically? <laughs> now, this is the effect of motion pictures and television. She said, you don't listen to anything but your penis. <laughs> so recovering quickly. <laughs> I said, uh, that's because it never lied to me. That's <laughs> good. That's good. It was really great. You know, if you look at the influences of, uh, of Western culture, uh, although I don't want to be a chauvinistic and ruin the president's roadmap to peace of Middle East, <laughs> there's an awful lot of Jewish influence. Uh, you know, it starts uh, probably with Moses. You know, at that time, people were just stealing each other's cattle. And uh, Moses said, there has to be law. Jewish guy invented law. And uh, people didn't accept it. You know, they said, no, no. I stole these fair and square. <laughs> so after him, uh, Jesus came, of course, was Jewish. And Jesus said, well, even if people transgress against you, uh, the answer is to forgive them. People said, no, no, not at all. Uh, I mean, I, I got these uh, cows, and I'm going to leave them to my children, and I won't forgive them. So the law of forgiveness were out. And then uh, uh, Karl Marx came along, another Jewish guy, and he said, uh, how about if you can't, uh, you can't obey the law, and you can't forgive them, could you share with them? So people went crazy, no! He said, fine. Then the next Jewish guy of influence is Freud, who says, if you, you can't obey the law and you can't forgive people who, who uh, uh, don't obey the law, and you, you can't share with them, could you understand them in some way? He said, no, no, not at all. So finally, uh, Einstein comes along with the atomic bomb and says to Roosevelt, I've got a bomb that can blow all of this up. This caught on. <laughs> Donald Rumsfeld. Bush says, uh, when 9-11 happened, this is the times that when it happened, he was lecturing at a, uh, a primary school in Tampa, Florida. <laughs> and he... Uh, he said that the kids didn't get it all, so he was using things of commonality with children. He was uh, operating a hand puppet who turned out to be the president of Afghanistan. Donald Rumsfeld, you know. Cheney is the only guy covered by Bush's health plan. <laughs> anyway. So where was I? Oh, yeah. So let me go back to this thing. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm, I had a job in Minneapolis for uh, the Heart of Hearing Institute, which is run by a guy named Bill Austin. He makes more hearing aids than anybody in the world. And uh, he made the acquaintance of President Bush by making him uh, a pair of headphones to take out the shriek in Fox News. <laughs> <laughs> what else would the President watch? So, uh, fair and balanced. <laughs> so he made this for him, and then Bush turned him over to his father, who was hard of hearing on both sides. And as you know, Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton both wore hearing aids made by Bill Austin. So I met him, and he told me he was going into uh, Cuba uh, to help the Cuban children because they shouldn't suffer uh, because of Castro. You know, funny, you know how all this comes around. Cuban Revolution was 50 years old last week. Elian Gonzalez just turned 35. <laughs> so, but Bush doesn't like him. Junior doesn't like uh, Fidel Castro. So uh, those of you who ever read a, a, a great book uh, called uh, Che, A Revolutionary Life by John Lee Anderson, it's a great book in there. And uh, it's about the six people around Castro and how they had the revolution. You know, the oldest guy there was 31. And, uh, 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 che Guevara, at 30, was the president of the Cuban National Bank. And uh, he ran the guerrilla school and he redistributed the land at 30. And the economy was a disaster. You know, it was a shambles. So this is a true story. 
Castro calls him in and he says to him, regardless of your good intentions, the economy is, is wrecked. And uh, uh, when I looked at the five of you and I said, which one of you is an economist? Why did you raise your hand? And Guevara said, I thought you said, which one of you is a communist? <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, great book. And John Lee Anderson covers Iraq for the New Yorker. If you see those dispatches every week, a great writer. So anyway, back to uh, back to uh, uh, to our point uh, here. What was I? Oh, so the heart of hearing need to raise money. So I get a call from Brad Freeman. You know, he's the Bush is elected now. You can't help there, and he's a shoe in to be reelected. So what you've got to? Uh, uh, could you help me with this heart of hearing thing? So I said, well, you know, anything I can do to help Cuban children here, you know, <laughs> my kind of thing. You know? uh, because, you know, I can't go to Europe anymore because of Roosevelt. You remember he said, France and Germany are the old Europe. He's only interested in Romania and Bulgaria. <laughs> so uh, any of you of Eastern European heritage? You know, Freud was once asked by a guy, he said, why... Uh, why did the Galaziana hate the Litvaks so much? And Freud said, it's the massive hostility of small differences. Well, he didn't get a laugh either. So, <laughs> so I, never mind. <laughs> Try to make up with me. You're uh, unforgiving. The unforgiving. So uh, anyway, let me, let me go back to this now. Uh, pretty exciting stuff. So I go to Minneapolis for this benefit. And we go up there, and uh, the standard stuff, you know, uh, Billy Graham and Norman Schwarzkopf, and let's help kids get hearing aids, and all that, and a big dinner. So uh, at the end of the dinner, the president comes in, you know, with the Secret Service, and guys talking about the cufflinks. <laughs> and uh, he comes over, and he's uh, talking to Billy Graham, and it's all a shuck for terrorism, you know, and what we've got to do and uh, on our watch, and we've got to show them. So they bring me up to the table to meet him. Everybody gets to meet him. Was on the show. I was on the show. So uh, uh, with mixed results. So my dad. So I go to see Bush and remind him how I met him in Austin and everything, and at the White House. And he was uh, you know, noncommittal. And then uh, he said to me, "I'm going to need your help in a kind of a royal we. You know, I need the help of all of you." to fight terrorism. Can I count on that? He's getting ready to go. You know. <laughs> and he'll go. So uh, he said, I need every bit of your energy directed toward fighting terrorism. So I said, well, I want to. But I'm awfully tired. You know, I fought communism with your father. <laughs> so, so he, he says to me, it's a dirty job, and I didn't relish it. But bring it on, because remember, that's what you elected me to do. So I said, we didn't elect you that much. <laughs> they think I'm a comedian, you know, so it's OK. And, uh, I, I, boy, I'll tell you, if you're going to go down, you've got to go down with more flames than this. He's a, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, <laughs> unbelievable. Well, they haven't got it in the bag yet. Anyway, uh, let me, uh, maybe they have. That's why Schultz is here. You know, if they start reacting, you know, and the proposition. So, uh, what is Proposition 13? It enables you to keep your home regardless of your property tax bill and uh, <laughs> overlook the lake as well as the payments. What does it do? Anyway, so I remember Howard Jarvis. So, uh, let us, uh, let us re return now. And, uh, you know who's always plugging, uh, Attacking Davis. The radio guys are all attacking Davis, aren't they? KFI and KABC. There's a lot of uh, kind of right-wing prattle. Some of you will be encouraged. I was in, uh, when I was in Chicago this week, I met the people who were starting the Liberal Radio Network. And uh, it's going to be interesting. They're going to have uh, um, um, Al Franken and Janine Garofalo. <laughs> yeah. They're going on the air with 14 hours of radio every day to fight Limbaugh. And, uh, you remember Limbaugh? Limbaugh is touched on the shoulder by God. He managed to go deaf and not have to listen to the program. <laughs> Let me ask you something about Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and all those guys. Couldn't the power in this country, if it wanted to sell fascism,
Couldn't they find a real fascist? <laughs> Why did they have to find a guy and teach him? Wrote <laughs> phrases. It's interesting, huh? It's, you know, a country of 270 million, can't you find a fascist? I mean, I find them under every rock. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, if you look at the country, when the country started, it had 4 million people in the colonies. And uh, the, look at the intellect, 4 million people. That's less than L.A. And uh, Jefferson, Washington, Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, look at it, uh, Tom Paine. And uh, now you have 274 million. And the intellect is George Bush, <laughs> Dick Cheney, uh, Gail Norton, Donald Rumsfeld. How do you explain this? Well, Darwin was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jeff Immelt, who took um, Jack Welch's place at, at GE, when it was found that Welch is seeing that girl at Harvard, who wasn't his wife, and it was an extreme alarm that he might be happy, <laughs> so, which we won't hear of. So anyway, so uh, Immelt is like at 38 and he's running General Electric. So I'm sitting at the table, and you know, uh, people of that kind of earning power are not great at small talk. So uh, Murdoch says to me, uh, you know, my home is in Adelaide, Australia, but I have a home in Bel Air and an apartment in Central Park South. Uh, uh -huh. and, he said, uh, and you're from California. I said, yes, I am. So then Emil says to me, uh, we live up in Bluff Harbor. You know those places up in New England? We're in Bluff Harbor under Snake Belly and all that stuff. So uh, he said, that, do you like California? I said, well, I used to. But it's unbelievable now. You know, because the governor hasn't defended our borders. <laughs> and new, new Jewish settlements being built in Palm Springs. <laughs> so he says to me, uh, do you think uh, we would like California, my family and I? I said, nah, we got a lot of problems. So he said, what are the problems? I said, gangs, for one thing. Uh, Sheriff Baca says, there are 7,500 guys in the front line of 600 gangs distributing cocaine in the nine western states. And they're carrying Uzi machine guns. It's heavy duty, you know? So, uh, and I said, Chief Bratton, you know? between photo opportunities, <laughs> has been studying this problem, along with his wife, Ricky Kleiman of Court TV, when they're not reporting on Robert Blake. So he said, a gang problem, huh? I said, yeah. And then Murdoch said to me, gang problem. I said, yeah. So uh, at the end of the dinner, <coughs> Immelt gives me his card, General Electric, Jeffrey Immelt, the president. And he says, if there's any way General Electric can help, you let me know. And then Murdoch said, the News Corporation will match any grant you get from GE. And I got these two cards. So I took my wife, and we're getting the car, and I said, you know, I may have been wrong in Berkeley, you know, and, and hanging out with Ralph Nader and Michael Moore, calling these guys fascists. I think they're pretty good citizens. So my wife, who's been through this with me before, <laughs> said to me, uh, oh, come on. <laughs> you know, somebody gives you a bad lamb chop, you know, and the cream brulee, and uh, you think you're reborn. What's the matter with you? And uh, I said, is it wrong to believe in these men? And uh, there are leaders. And she said, believe in them. You can believe in them. You're not that positive. You're never happy. You weren't happy when you were Kennedy. You weren't happy <laughs> So I said to her, I'll bet you I hear from them, and I bet you a uh, fall wardrobe. So she said, OK. So uh, I won. It's an incredible uh, development of events. I won. I heard from both of them. Let me tell you what they did. There are two major gangs out here, the Bloods and the Crips. General Electric bought the Bloods. <laughs> Corporation bought the Crips. <laughs> and they sent two cost accountants out from New York and began laying people off. <laughs> now, uh, the, la <laughs> the last thing I want to say tonight, certainly the last thing I want to say, I want to talk to you about my friend Woody Allen. You know, he's got a new movie coming out. 
I've known him 44 years. He's got a new movie coming out with uh, Christina Ricci and Jason Biggs, and he's going to go to the Venice Film Festival. So what, he and I have had a, a wonderful life since, you know, he started The Hungry Eye after I had been there for a while. I was kind of a mistake up there. It wasn't that I was first or anything, but I was, but I didn't know what I was doing anyway. Anyway, so uh, Woody uh, did an interview. He's very self-effacing. That's the reason I brought this up. In a business that's plagued by narcissism, you know, actors think they can do everything. I mean, look at, <laughs> look at Mel Gibson. <laughs> hey, Jews were rather brutal in a crucifixion. I know, well, they couldn't subcontract uh, it to the Romans, so they did it. Um, anyway, uh, actors are impossible. And, you know, in my career, uh, trying to pay the rent, you know, I was a writer for a while, a very short time, in pictures. And uh, uh, actors take themselves very seriously. I think you all know that. And uh, one time I had to go to London to work on a movie with uh, Michael King. And uh, I went into his restaurant, which is called Langan's Brasserie in Piccadilly. And uh, I went in there. And you know, anybody else would say, hello, Mort, right? do not say that. He looks up. He's at the cash register. And he looks up and he says to me, Mort, what are you doing in England? It's like a fire alarm, you know? So I said to him, well, <clears throat> we're all back. The experiment failed. <laughs> but not Woody. Not Woody. You, you see an interview with Woody? He talks about Vittoria De Sica and Ingmar Bergman. He loves talent, and he's deferential uh, to his competitors. He's unbelievable. So anyway, I pick up the New Yorker and there's a big interview in there with him. And all he talks about is other people. And then he says, before I was a director, I was a comedian. And I had grave doubts about the way I was accepted. And he says, uh, more changed my life. It's pretty generous. And he said, I was walking around San Francisco in despair. And I went into the hungry eye by mistake, this little cellar. And there's a guy up there at midnight with a newspaper and a sweater, and he's talking on in five-syllable world, uh, words about psychology and politics and everything. And he said, I realize you can be accepted on your own terms. And he said, this, this guy fascinated me. He wasn't dressed formally, and he was working out of the news. No one was laughing. It was a new form of comedy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Nice for your contribution. So I figure that's pretty nice. More changed my life. So I call up the New Yorker. Where can I get him? Call Miramax Films. So like, Miramax? Yeah, he's under contract to Miramax now. So I said, great. And you know Miramax. You know how good they are. I'm sure a lot of you go to their movies. They, uh, they met, found a way to make foreign films here in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> the Weinstein Brothers. So I go to uh, uh, at the Miramax, and they said, well, uh, he'll probably be at the party tonight. There's going to be a screening of his movie, and you can go to the Paramount Theater, and then you can go to the party. So I said, great. So uh, I see the movie, and I laugh a lot, and I'm going to go tell him, thank you for saying that changed your life. So I walk into the restaurant, and uh, all these people are drinking and yelling about the movie and everything, and Woody is way in the back with Sun Yi, quietly, with his fishing hat, eating. So I start to go over to him. So this bodyguard comes up, and he says, Jill, where are you going, pal? I said, I'm going to see Woody. He's a man of the people. He said, no, no, no. He said, Woody has a right to be alone. He's given everything to people, much as Manoletti the bullfighter did. He had a terrible time with Mia Farrow and a compliant press. And now he's finally found love and serenity, and we owe it to him to let him uh, enjoy that. So I said, well, you know, you're very sensitive for a bodyguard. <laughs> Would you tell him I'm here? He says, I, can't, I don't remember names, so don't lay your name on me. So I said, look, just go to him and say, the guy that changed his life is here. <laughs> so he goes over to Woody, and he says, there's a guy on the steps, and he says, he's the guy that changed your life. So Woody looks over, and he takes the fishing hat off. You know how, uh, you, uh, paradoxically, you know how quiet he always is. He comes running over to me, and he gives me this bone-crushing bear hug, and he leans back and he said to me, can you change it back? 
My first time with you is I had this, I was a young actor and uh, trying to be a stand-up and so I got this bread and butter job and I was the maitre d' at the Vanguard. No kidding. And so while my friends were thinking I, I was seeing uh, Miles Davis and Sonny Rollins and all those people, Lambert Hendricks and Ross, I was secretly saying, no, I'm seeing Lenny and Mort, Mike and Elaine, Roger Price, Erwin Corey. That's right. Ugh. There are only Max six guys. The widow is still there. With there the were only six I... comics that Max allowed in that room because he thought they went with jazz. Yeah, you know, when we were up at the Blue Angel, Winters and I, he said we should come downtown and build a legacy in New York. He offered us 200 a week. And the next day he called us and said he thought it over and wouldn't work, and we were both so crushed. <laughs> you know, we called Los Angeles and sold our cars. And you, you remember Herb Sargent, Paul? Sure. I was in the Blue Angel, and... Uh, Jacoby didn't like uh, confrontations, so he'd pretend to be in the audience. So I was up there working, and he said, louder. Then he'd go to the other side of the room, and he'd say, I can't hear you. <laughs> and, Pretending uh, to be the audience. I said, what did he say as a put-on? And Herb said, I can't pay you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> I just talked to him today, see if he was all right in the blackout. Herb. Oh, jeez. Well, that's amazing. You certainly keep up with your old friends, don't you? What he said to me the other day, uh, I didn't know who those musicians were when I worked with them. You know, the MJQ and Brubeck and... Ah, oh, great people down there. Stan Getz. I was there one night when Miles Davis, who had a reputation for hating white people, as many of those guys did, turned and punched out his trombone player on the stage. His name was Jimmy Nepper. And he just packed up his horn and left. <laughs> in the is, middle of a performance. Jimmy Nepper? Yeah. Remember Jimmy Nepper? Yeah, he just passed away. I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, because every time I pick up the times, the obits scare the hell out of me. It's I all know. the jazz guys. You see. And uh, those. Oh, he's this eight old, and I'm that old. <laughs> Bill Russo. <laughs> yes. In Chicago. Yeah. And uh, didn't we meet in Chicago first? Well, I met you a couple of times in odd places, like backstage. I finally got to be through Irwin Arthur. You remember him? Yeah, I talked to him today. Jesus, you talk to everybody today. <laughs> Is that the guy that limps? Yeah. Yeah, that's he's everyone's agent. He was. <laughs> anyway, I I would go in the amateur hours at number one fifth and Paul Mazursky was there with Herb Harding. They'd had a comedy team. Phyllis Diller was over there. And then I would do upstairs at Please upstairs name. at the duplex in Sheridan Square. And the uh, Jim Paul Eiler show place on Fourth Street. Anyway, so I'm breaking in. Well, without anybody's help, I got a shot on the Tonight Show with Jack Parr, and then Irwin booked me in The Blue Angel, uh, Hungry Eye, and Mr. Kelly's, and I did about two years of it, and I didn't go up the ladder all that much, but I worked, but I discovered there were only six rooms in the country that a hip kind of intellectual comedian could play, then you were right. nowhere. So he booked me places where I'd get canceled, in for two weeks out in one. The only place I could work was at a hip kind of smart city audience, like urban audience, like uh, the crowd back there, you know, they kept asking me the Tribune about uh, about uh, why does Chicago work, and I told them about the constituency of that audience. They really built a bridge to you. It's a great audience in Chicago. Yeah. I, I gave up stand-up when I got into Second City, so that I had more fun somehow. I was with Arkin and Barbara Harris, Severin Darkin. You remember when all those guys left the Compass and took the material that was developed communally? Each one left with the material. Well, Jack Burns and Avery Schreiber did that, too. They had certain pieces they did there, then they took it with them. Everybody did that, didn't they? Well, they gave some money to the guy that ran, uh, Bernie, who ran Second City. They paid him a little fee. But a lot of people did. David Steinberg used to take Severin Darden's material, put it, do it in nightclubs. <laughs> the whole city took pride in Second City. People had taken their whole yes. near-north bunch, the industrial designers and the political guys. And I was thrilled to find, I have a second cousin who manages this place. Oh, yeah? Named Jeff Davis. 
and I heard you were going to be here, and I was thrilled to come and see what you'd do with George Bush, you know. Because I knew you'd be hitting they, things the way you always did. They don't, um, they don't want to do it, or they've gotten out of the habit. They were way too compliant, the guys. You know, they're, it may be their parents didn't have any politics. That might be the... There's no well, appetite for... Paul, what was stuff. a picture you did where you met that gal and you took her to the concerts? It's called Perfect Couple. I saw it last night with my 17-year-old. She had never seen it. We looked at it last Van night. Van Heflin's daughter was his... The, no, it's his niece. Uh, niece Marta niece. Heflin was the girl. Yeah. yeah. Marta Heflin. Yeah. Niece. I niece, yeah. I Van Heflin's niece. Oh, okay. Let me in here. Okay. It's a kind of a cute picture. Yeah. I like the music, too. Yeah, it had a real good feel to it. Well, I was... I had an odd story. I was 49 years old. I've been a New York stage actor and different things, stand-up, improv. And then Robert Altman discovered me, you know. And I did six <laughs> pictures in a row for him, one of them being Perfect Couple. And a wedding, and Popeye, and a bunch of different films. But I loved working with him, and I loved the films we made. But they weren't all popular, but, uh, but it was great. When I uh, was first writing, <clears throat> Altman was the other side of Peck and Paw. You know, the, the rule breaking, <laughs> that was the other side. Rebels. And he used a lot of the same people. Yeah, it's a big stock company of those when you work in those pictures. And it's all kind of the same people. Do you ever remember around off Broadway, Libertini and Dixon, who were called the Stewed Prunes? Yeah. And Richard uh, Libertini, McIntyre Dixon. Oh. Uh, Wonderful. Whatever happened to Andy from Second City? Andrew is, is still around. Uh, he doesn't work much anymore. He has a little, uh, bought a kind of a summer house up near the Canadian border and keeps a place in Manhattan. He's a very, very good friend of mine because when we left Second City, the advertising agency, agencies glommed on to us improvisers, or even though when we were still there. But Severn and Barbara and Tony Holland and all these different people, none of them wanted to do it. They thought that was selling out to be in a commercial. But Andrew and I didn't. And we were wasps, and we didn't have any ethnic qualities. <laughs> and we began to do hundreds of commercials and eventually specialized in radio comedy. And uh, pretty soon, we didn't just get paid for acting and giving the writing for free. We began to charge for the writing, too. So we formed a company to do radio comedy. So I've done thousands of jobs with Andrew. I did, uh, we did a show for Pat Weaver called Comedy News at ABC. I, I remember it. And he was the anchor. I think Anthony Holland was in it, too. That's right. Yeah. Oh, uh, Andrew was wonderful. And every yeah. book on Second City always says he was the heart and soul, and he was the spine, and he'd always hold the whole show together. He, uh, yeah, and he had a he had a look of legitimacy. When he started there as the anchor, he looked like, instead of the way comedians approach it. Yeah, he was very real-seeming. And, you know, if they needed an interviewer, a doctor, a lawyer, a psychiatrist, a teacher, he did all those roles. The straight guy. Yeah, but he's very funny and oh, great yeah. timing and very inventive. When I used to go down to that place called the Upstairs at the Duplex, <laughs> Jack Rollins was down there trying to insist that Woody became a comedian. That's right. <laughs> they had to talk uh, him into it, didn't they? And he'd be back. Yeah, he didn't really want Barely. to do it. Yeah, that's what Mort said. And he used to be backstage. I was... Different people at different times, but one night I was on the bill all for free. We each did about five minutes. Streisand, Woody, Peter Bonners, George Siegel with the banjo, uh, Gary Marshall came and tried out stand up. <laughs> you know, he's a writer. Uh, but Woody would say, I'm supposed to be third, but will you go third and let me go fourth? Okay. And then he'd say to the next guy, Can I go fifth? I was like, <laughs> oh. He never wanted to go out. He didn't want to do it. No, they really had to twist his arm and. Uh... The whole gang that came up with me, the ones that aren't really, well, they weren't known as primarily as actors, except for Shelley, maybe, but um, they really hated the road, universally. So did I. You know, uh, I'm working with Larry David now on uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Well, you know, Bob then. Uh, yeah. Why do you? Oh, yeah, sure. Good friend. Yeah, he's terrific. Well, Shelley plays his father, and I play his father-in-law. Uh, on Curb Your Enthusiasm, Larry David's show. And we improvise it. We have an outline and we improvise the show. I know the writers guild is chasing him. <laughs> <laughs> the contributions. Herb is chasing him. <laughs> the only difference is that we improvise it, but Larry comes in with nine lines in his head that he knows he wants to get in. Because he's a writer. And he but I don't even want to see this till I get there. There's no outline, there's no script. Well it's funny about comedians, you know, to this day we're looking at hope. 
He's in his own movie. The actors are doing the script. And he's in his own movie. You know, where he's talking to the wall. They're not great at listening. <laughs> Steve Allen. Steve said the final irony was that people who couldn't talk had talk shows. <laughs> he was tolerant of just about everything else. Good guy. It's an interesting well, statement. It's, it's more than talking. I mean, the great talk show hosts have always been people like Carson who, who knew how to listen. He knew how to take a back seat to a guest. He knew how to let you get by with being unpleasant sometimes. He was just a gentleman. You know? Jack, too. Is... Yeah. I saw him in uh, Stanford a few years back before the stroke and everything. He was living up in Greenwich. He was a hell of a man. He would really, you know. People liked him because he let his emotions show. Whereas most people don't. Took on the American press, remember? Yeah, and he would cry and he would walk out. There was a lot of vitality in that building. You remember the that soda fountain downstairs at NBC? Down in Rockefeller Center? Well, you'd, I remember we all hung around. You'd go in there and you'd see guys like Marty Balsam between live shows. and well, boy. This, this drugstore in Rockefeller Center, a lot of actors hung out there. Then there was a third floor or something where there were benches and a lot of people hung out there like who were, who were on shows or between shows or doing radio shows and, or just making the rounds. You could always see interest, like, like Marty Balsy, you could see people like that all over the place. God, what an amazing time. Mm. Much simpler. Those guys were like girders. They held the whole damn building up. I mean, anyway, it's like yeah. Capra's bunch. Well, mm -hmm. that's the days of the golden days of early television with the anthologies and the good writing. At the service for Dick Crenna over at the Academy, uh, Dick Van Dyke talked about how grateful he was to have been part of what I didn't realize was a golden era, he said. And, uh, well, Crenna, he had Rod Serling. He was way back. He was a kid actor, wasn't he? Yeah, he started uh, with us when he was uh, 13. We were in junior high, and he started in radio, and he never stopped. Everything sold. Oh, my God. And he didn't change that much, which is a really remarkable guy. Well, those, just on one show, they had Patty Chayefsky, Serling, Sterling Siliphant. Studio One? Studio One. <clears throat> great, great, great writers. They all become very well known later. Cliff Robertson. Yeah, Newman, yeah uh, Paul Newman used to act on those shows. Jack Klugman. Then the movie started to raid them all, remember? Was they coming out and doing pictures? And I used to do Hallmark Hall of Fame at Armstrong Circle Theater, do extras on those shows. I might have come to New York about the same time you did. West Point. That, that's a, <laughs> that's a <laughs> Gotta keep your father happy. That's a that threw me. That's a mind boggler. I like the line about listening to your penis. It sounds like a line you may have used a few years ago. Freud. I know what I mean. It, it had the ring of a classic line. But, for, but that continuity we used to have of working every night. Like a guy like Eddie Murphy when he was a young Turk and he was fighting the system and he was the kid breaking in. But now that you know he's a millionaire with big homes and cars, he doesn't have the same edge as he used to. Mm. You know, they get too rich and too no, famous. No, he was dangerous on Saturday night. Yeah, and he was like a... As a kid, you, you gave him a lot of leeway for being angry. Well, you know, the rules of this establishment here, when I broke in here, um, it was go away if you're different because you're threatening. But if, you, if they can't make you go away, they're already working on absorbing you <laughs> in one form or another, <laughs> incorporating yeah, you interesting. with certain concessions. What about Eddie Izzard? Have you, you never ever, seen him. Never seen him. Oh, I know sorry. about him. He's very funny. I, I never saw the show. About, yeah, because he does improv. He, uh, off the top of his head, he, on his feet. He develops it on his feet. Uh, was he good in that show? He's a good actor? He's a good actor. He's a transvestite. He's uh, not gay, but not he gay. likes to dress up in kind but of glitzy he, he, clothes. He wears uh, high heels, uh, but like not high heel, high heels. Uh, they're, but they're high heels. <laughs> like he calls boots. himself a, an executive transvestite. An executive. But he's a hilarious. Very, uh, very funny. funny. <laughs> uh, very English. Uh, hot, very hot now. He's got about eight, nine, ten. Robin videos. Williams helped him a lot, didn't he? Yes, as I understand. He's doing Joe Egg in New York, I think. But you've never seen him. That's interesting. Hey, partner. Wonderful. Absolutely. I right. could say the same thing. 
Well, you could. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're going to run away. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's hey, get back to your life. Brazil is wonderful. <laughs> your sons. Well. Congratulations. Paul, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Yes, thanks, for coming. Yeah, yeah, Hello to Bob <laughs> thanks for coming. Oh, you know Bob McCarty? Yeah, I know Bob McCarty. Super. It's good to Bob see you. Bob McCarty, if you're still alive, I know I am. Hello. And Andrew's alive and well and kicking somewhere up in New York State, north of the border. Right next to um, Canada. And you were on the But he's still with keeping up there. Anyways, great to see you electronically. Once in a while, I go back and look at the old films you made together, like the thing we did with Dan Greenberg. You remember that? I could never. This guy knows more than I do about these things. Anyway, it's good to not see you again. And uh, yeah, because he's not a liberal. That's how I made friends with.